Welcome to today's webinar, Affording Senior Living. I'm your host, Janet Parker Evans. And you know, nowadays, everyone's looking for transparency and pricing when planning for the later stages in life. And today we're gonna to look at what kinds of services tend to be included in senior living costs and how you can plan ahead to be in the best shape financially. All right, let's jump in and meet our speaker, Jean Chatsky. Hello, Jean. Hi. Hi. Jean is the founder and CEO of HerMoney.com and the coaching program, Finance Fix. She's the host of the podcast, Her Money with Jean Chatsky, and the co-host of the national radio show, Everyday Wealth. The financial ambassador for AARP, she was the financial editor for NBC Today for 25 years. Jean is an award-winning journalist and broadcaster, a New York Times and Wall Street Journal best-selling author, and a fierce advocate for financial literacy. Her latest book is How to Money, a guidebook for Gen Z women, and you can follow her at Jean Chatsky. Welcome, Jean. Hello. Oh, hey, Hi. Janet. Thanks so much for having me today. It's a pleasure to be with you. Thank you so much for being here. So how about we start off with you telling us, what do you think people find intimidating about saving for retirement? Boy, I, I could make a, a huge list of all of the things that I think people feel intimidating, but Basically, it boils down to the fact that there are a ton of unknowns. And, and one of the biggest unknowns is how long we are going to live, which is why a number of years ago, I put together a, a guidebook that helps people deal with longevity. I wrote it with the doctor um, and helps them deal with their health and their wealth in a combined way. So I'm going to take a step back. I'm going to tell you a little bit about that. Then Janet will come back and we're going to answer some questions. By the way, I hope you have questions because questions are my favorite part of any sort of webinar or any sort of interaction. And can I also just say it's really nice. I, I grew up in the Midwest. I was telling Janet that it's nice to see people from my hometowns popping into the webinar, Madison, Wisconsin being one of those. So I actually thought I would I would kick this off with a little bit of a confession. And in about a month and a half now, I am going to be 58 years old, which is a, a big number for me. I mean, I've got to tell you that that the run up to just playing 50, the, the big 5-0 made me incredibly nervous. But then my friends who had already been there and done that, started to come out of the woodwork and tell me that being 50 made them bolder. They felt free to say whatever they wanted to say, whenever they wanted to say it. They felt like they had this license to just take off the gloves. And now that I've been there for a while, now that I can actually see myself closing in on the big 6-0, I have to say it's really true. And it has colored the things that I want to talk to all of you about today. Because, because of the changing financial landscape, having a firm grip on your money, it has never been more important than it is today. And it's not because money needs to be your number one priority or my number one priority. It's that money is what makes all of those other priorities possible. And the only way, the only way to get a grip on it is to start having important conversations like this one. So Janet, I'm really glad um, uh, to be here. Thank you for the invitation. Thank you, Brookdale, for the invitation. Um, it's a pleasure to be with all of you today. And at the risk of making a little too much of my age, let me just say that I've been doing this work for a very long time time. I have been watching how we make our money, save it, spend it, invest it, protect it for more than 30 years. And so I feel like I'm a good person to tell you that the relationships that many of us have with money are, are a bit of a hot mess. So why is that? First of all, right now, you cannot ignore the pandemic in the room. We are still dealing with COVID and it has changed the way that we look at money 
and also has had this profound impact on the economy. Um, you saw just a new round of inflation numbers come, at, come out a couple of hours ago. Look, initially COVID was a, a bit of a mixed bag economically. It led to the K-shaped recovery that you've heard so much about with people who were able to work remotely actually socking more into their savings and investments than they had been previously. And the markets, once they dipped in March of 2020, going on a tear to come right back up. But right now, the picture is a little bit more daunting. We have inflation that is close to the worst that we've seen in 40 years. The current round of interest rate hikes that the Federal Reserve has undertaken to tame inflation has the markets worried, has the markets unusually volatile. Simultaneously, housing prices are starting to fall as mortgage rates are starting to climb. All of these things are making us nervous. The second factor on the list is the amount of financial weight on all of our shoulders. In the last two to three decades in this country, we have become much more responsible for our own personal financial lives than the other generations that came before us. Our grandparents, maybe even some of our parents, they had pensions and, and they knew that they could live on those pensions until they died. We have 401ks, 403bs, IRAs, other <laughs> retirement accounts that we have to fund and then manage ourselves. Our parents had health coverage. It came with the job. If it didn't get them to Medicare, sometimes it lasted their whole lives. Whether or not we get health care from our employers or we buy it ourselves from the exchanges, our coverage costs us more every single year in the form of rising premiums and co-pays and prescription drug costs. And while early generations, earlier generations, had a lot of confidence that Social Security and Medicare would fill in the gaps, not just for them, but for their kids, many of us, maybe even most of us, don't. One study showed that more Generation Xers believe in UFO than believe that Social Security will be around to provide for them and their kids long term. The third and final factor in this big equation that's making us nervous is life expectancy, as I alluded to earlier. My husband and I, we play a game when we go to visit the financial advisor, and I'm sure many of you have played a version of the same. It's called, how long am I going to live? And the answer is longer than you ever expected. In the past three decades, life expectancy rates for men in this country, they have jumped from 70 to 76. Women have jumped from 77 to 81. But here's the thing that many people just don't get about longevity. The longer you live, the longer you're going to live. Wrap your brain around that for a second. because. What it means is that today, although the average 65-year-old will live to 84, half of all those 65-year-olds, they are going to hit 84 and just keep on going. One in four will pass 90. One in 10 will pass 95. The number of Americans who are age 100 or older has gone up 2,200% since the 1950s. And here's the icing on the cake. In February of 2015, Time Magazine put this gorgeous baby on the cover of its issue and declared it likely that this kid would live to be 142 years old. How many of you think that's great news? How many of you are not so sure? Look, I get it. I, I know some of you are in your 30s and in your 40s, but trust me, with added years come added fears. There is the fear 
that you are going to run out of money. There is the fear that you are going to break a hip, and we all know what happens after that. There is the fear that you are going to start losing your keys or that your memory will start to go, which is why after writing nine books all about money, I took a turn and I wrote one with a doctor. What I realized over the last few years was that if we want all of these additional years that we're going to get to be good ones for ourselves and for the people that we care about, we have to be age-proof. So let's define it. To be age-proof, you need a grip on both your health and your finances. I wrote this book with a doctor named Michael Roizen, who you may have seen on the Dr. Oz show. For many, many years, he was the chief wellness officer at the Cleveland Clinic. And we wrote it together because we realized both at the same time that money without good health, it just doesn't work anymore. Even if you have substantial financial resources, poor health will eventually wreak havoc on your bank account. And health without money, that might be possible when you're in your 30s, maybe your early 40s. But as we age and add people like chiropractors and physical therapists to our contact lists, we need more in the way of resources just to stay healthy. And so today, before I turn it back to Janet, I'm going to talk about a few of the key principles of age-proofing so that you can take some immediate steps to protect yourself and the people that you care about, not just for today, but for tomorrow. The, the first strategy involved in age-proofing is doing an assessment. I want you to think for a second about what you do when you get up every single morning. You check your phone. We all check our phones, but then maybe maybe you hit the treadmill, you hop in the shower, you shave, you brush your teeth, you make the coffee, on and on and on. But you also do something else and you probably do it more than once. You look in the mirror, you check yourself out in the mirror. And you do this because you inherently know that there is value to this process of self-evaluation. The problem is when it comes to our health and when it comes to our finances, many of us are just too scared to look in that mirror. So this is where age-proofing starts with a series of, on the financial side, assessments, many of which you can do yourself. We start with three big questions. What do you earn? what do you own, and what do you owe? And over time, we want to see those first two numbers, your income and your assets or your net worth moving steadily upward with your debts or your liabilities moving in the other direction with a goal of paying off the mortgage before you retire. Next, is there a substantial and separate pot of cash just to cover emergencies. During COVID, we learned an emergency fund, it is not a want to have, it is a must have. And I believe that a three to six month emergency fund is pretty fine during your working years, but as you close in on retirement, and particularly once you enter retirement. In addition to that emergency fund, you need to have a couple of years in cash just to handle swings in the market. We also look at your retirement trajectory. I'm often asked by people, how do you know? How do you know that you have enough money set aside for retirement. So I have a very handy series of benchmarks that I use. Feel free to take a couple of notes, but here's the way they go. By the time you are 30, you should have one times your annual income set aside for retirement. At 43 times, at 56 times, at 68 times, and by the time you actually retire, 10 times your current income. And the point, the point of this retirement stash is when it's combined with social security to be enough to replace about 
80% of your pre-retirement income. Which brings me to age-proof strategy number two. Once we assess, we adjust. Because I know that there are some of you listening to me describe these benchmarks and you're thinking, whoa, you know, I am not where I'm supposed to be. That's okay. You have a number of different levers that you can maneuver, that you can control in order to get your financial life into the right shape. But assessing, looking at the numbers is the only thing that makes that possible. So what are those levers? Well, you can continue to work a little bit longer. You can save more of your income by adjusting your standard of living now rather than later, perhaps downsizing a little bit earlier than anticipated, or if you're able to work remotely, perhaps moving somewhere that's a little bit less expensive. You can take a look at your investments to see how your assets are allocated and if perhaps you should be taking a little bit more risk. And you can meet with a financial advisor to help you make a specific plan to get where you want to go. I think 10 years out from retirement, at least an initial meeting with a financial advisor is a must. And then you can apply age-proof strategy number three, mind games. Here, here's the deal. When it comes to human beings, we as a species, we were designed to survive the day. We were designed to just kill our prey and eat it immediately because it wasn't a sure thing that another meal would be available anytime soon. And unfortunately, although it's been many years since our caveman and woman ancestors, we have not evolved as much as we'd like to think. So when we opt for delayed gratification rather than immediate gratification, making a good financial decision to save money rather than spend it, we are actually going against the way that we as human beings are wired. We are going against our own basic instincts and our brains, they don't like that. That's something that you can actually see scientists, they're called neuroeconomists, now routinely run experiments where they use MRIs to look at our brains in the process of making choices about money. And what they see is that when something we want to buy comes into view, the, the pleasure centers in our brains, they light right up. And when we actually get the item, we get a feel-good rush of the chemical dopamine. The trouble is, if you delay the availability of that item, of that thing that you want to buy, of the reward, even by as little as a day, you have to make that reward much, much larger in order to get the same pleasurable response from your brain. And things way off in our futures, like retirement, they don't light up our brains much at all. So here's where mind games come in. We use mind games like automation and substitution to make sure that situations like that are few and far between. Automation is the mind game, the magic bullet, whatever you wanna call it, that makes 401k and other work-based retirement plans work their magic. The money goes in automatically and because you don't see it in your paycheck or your checking account, you don't touch it. You don't spend it. And the fact that there are nasty taxes and penalties for pulling money out before you hit age 59 and a half, it just provides another layer of encouragement to keep your hands off the money. The key is taking this sort of magic and applying it in other places in your life, automating contributions into that emergency savings account that I was talking about, as well as IRAs, health savings accounts, 529 college savings plans. And there are other automations that you can use as well, like 
paying bills automatically so that they're never late and rebalancing investments with a target date retirement fund or a managed account so that your asset allocation doesn't get out of whack. Where you can't automate, you want to think about substituting. So research has found breaking a bad habit in and of itself, it's really, really hard to do. It, it often doesn't work. What does work is replacing that habit with a better one. So that bowl of ice cream that you eat routinely after dinner, it becomes a healthy walk around the block. That second glass of wine becomes a healthier piece of dark chocolate. And when it comes to, say, spending, that Starbucks that you buy on the way to work becomes Starbucks that you brew at home. Even all that time surfing online that you are spending currently, you can turn that into an extra hour or two of sleep. I could go on and on and on. There are plenty of other financial tactics in the book, as well as a lot of health suggestions. But the upshot of applying them, you're hedging your bets so that you have more money today to use to create the life that you want tomorrow. And now I'm going to turn it back to Janet and we're going to answer some of your questions. A lot of people are at the stage in their life where they're starting to consider senior living and maybe they're not 30, 40, 50, maybe they're in their late fifties or they're 60 or, or 60 plus. And some of them are going to have initial sticker shock when they mm -hmm. consider senior living. They may think they can't afford it long-term. What factors go into calculating your net worth and how do people use that info to help them afford senior living? I think one of the places that people get stuck here is that we're used to thinking in terms of our investable assets. We're, we're used to looking at our wealth and not counting our primary residence. But in fact, many of us have most of our wealth tied up in our primary residence. So when you're considering senior living, the, the big factor that makes it possible for many people is just the idea that you're going to get rid of the house and all of the ancillary expenses that go along with the house. And so I'm I'm a data geek. If if you didn't realize that with all the statistics that I was spouting at you, then uh, you're going to realize it soon because you've got to really open your files, open your folders, and deal with the numbers. And, and that means taking a look at where your money is actually going today, right? There are expenses that are tied up with being a homeowner, not in a senior living situation, that fall by the wayside once you are in a senior living situation. So for example, maintenance on your home. Harvard Research has calculated that equals a good one to 2% of the value of your home every year. Once you're in a, a different sort of a living situation, that may be something that's off your plate. Similarly, how much are you paying for landscaping? How much are you paying for snow removal? How much are you paying for the second car that you're not going to need once so many of these services are provided for you in a um, more convenient way? And so I, I would say, take a look at where all of your money is going today. And then once you start to explore senior living, you can look at the value that is being offset by some of those current expenses against the ones that you're um, no longer going to need. Does that make sense? It does. And let's look at a scenario, maybe a hypothetical scenario Let's say uh, the community that a retired couple is looking at and they're most interested, let's say it costs $4,000 a month. How could they evaluate whether that's affordable and sustainable? Like what questions should they ask themselves? They're a financial advisor, their children. What questions should they ask when they're considering something like that? So you want to make sure that you've got enough money coming in in the form of what I like to call guaranteed income 
to support that $4,000 a month. You've got to bank on the fact that that $4,000 a month is going to be an expense that you are going to have for the rest of your life. So you look at your different sources of income. And yeah, I'm, I'm a big fan, as you heard, of doing this with a financial advisor. You look at, all right, what am I expecting to get from social security? Do I have a pension? Um, and then you look at what's my nest egg look like? What will I have in terms of a chunk of assets once I, for example, sell the house and combine that with my retirement account or my 401k? Um, many people, I think, are familiar with what we call the 4% rule, um, which is basically a rule of thumb that says if you invest your nest egg, you can count on being able to withdraw about 4% from that account every single year um, and know that it will last you a good 30 years. So you take the pension, if you have one, the social security, the um, the 4% that you're pulling off, or if you decide, well, the markets are making me nervous, I don't want to be subject to the markets to that degree, then you can look at taking a chunk of that next nest egg and converting it to a paycheck using like a fixed immediate annuity so that you know, okay, my $4,000, that's set. I don't have to worry about that. I like that. I didn't hear the 4% before, so that's new news to me. You know, um, it's interesting. 4% is a, it's a, it's a number that has been floating around for about 30 years. Um, some recent research has said if the markets are down, particularly in your early years of retirement, you're going to be better off if you back off a little bit and just take about three. But um, but 4% is generally what we're looking at. Got it. That sounds doable too. Like that's not such a scary number. Right. Exactly. Right. I mean, because, you know, all right, if you have a million dollars, that's $40,000 a year. Yeah. I mean, that's that's a substantial that's a substantial chunk of money. It may be taxed. It may not be taxed. You got to look at that. But but you add that to Social Security and all of a sudden that four thousand dollar a month nut is not so difficult to achieve. Right. So taxed or, or taxable or untaxable. Are there certain types of investment accounts that are better than others for long term planning, like retirement and senior living? Um, I like having a mix. Um, I. I a lot of people these days are, are putting money not just in a traditional 401k or IRA, but also in a Roth IRA, um, where Roth IRA is a bucket of money on which the taxes have already been paid. So when you pull it out for retirement, you don't have to pay taxes. Um, right now, because the markets are down, they're down big today, um, a lot of people are looking at whether converting some money to a Roth is something that makes sense. Again, this, these are individual discussions. Um, you want to discuss them with your uh, financial advisor and 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 understand what taxes are going to do to your nest egg. You, you know, if you've got a million dollars in retirement and it's in a 401k, that's not a million dollars. That's a million dollars before taxes, which is substantially less. There's other ways we can invest to, and other things we can do to protect ourselves. And one of them we talk about a lot is long-term care insurance. Can you talk about how that works and how it can help pay for senior living? So long-term care insurance is basically what used to be called nursing home insurance, but has become a wider bucket of benefits over the past couple of decades. It, it's an insurance policy that you buy so that if you need care later in life, you can get it either at home or in a senior living facility. And, and there are a number of senior living facilities that will step down, step up your benefits, step up your level of care, and you don't have to move. So, so that's a, an important thing to keep in mind when you're shopping. There, there are different kinds of long-term care insurance. These days, there is your plain vanilla long-term care, which is what I just described. You make a premium payment 
and it pays off a benefit if you need care. But the problem that people have had with that kind of insurance through the years is that it's pretty pricey. And if you don't lose it, it's like your homeowner's policy. I mean, you hope that you'll never have to use it, but if you don't lose it, you've paid these premiums and you're not gonna get anything back. So we've seen an evolution in the types of policies that exist. And now there are a number of hybrid policies, which are things like life insurance policies with a rider or a a bucket of benefits that can be used to pay for long-term care. So this is what I bought, for instance. I bought a life insurance policy where if I need long-term care, my family can use proceeds from this policy on a monthly basis. They can actually use the death benefit in order to pay for my care until it runs out. If I don't need it, or if there's money left before I die, then that money then goes to my kids. A lot of different options there. We talked a little bit earlier about the value of your home or the fact that that's a big financial asset you have that you might get rid of, you know, to help fund the rest of of your life in a different manner. But what about a reverse mortgage and who would be a good candidate for a reverse mortgage? And what's the smart way to use the money? Like, could let's say um, an adult child finance some care for their parent in assistant living who might need it using reverse mortgage? Like what's the smart way to use the money? The hard part about a reverse mortgage is that once the primary residents who live in that home and own that home move out, the house has to be sold. So just sort of keep that in the back of your mind. A reverse mortgage is exactly what it sounds like. Instead of you paying the bank every month to buy an additional piece of your home, you borrow from the bank every month and the bank then owns a bigger share of your home. Your equity, instead of going up, goes down. Reverse mortgages don't make sense until people are in their 60s. The way the rules work, the older you are, the more money you're going to actually get out of a reverse mortgage because the bank, which is lending you this money, has to let you stay there as long as you want until you die. Um, they can't force you out even if you've already borrowed all of the money out of that reverse mortgage. Um, you get the opportunity to stay. You have to pay the taxes. You have to pay the insurance. But you can continue to stay. And so for that reason, they don't make them for people who are not over, who are younger than I believe it's 62 at this point. And the older you are, the more money you're going to get out of it. The nice thing about a reverse mortgage these days is that you can take the money in several different ways. So you can take the money as a chunk of cash, or you can take it on a monthly basis, or you can set it up as a line of credit. So it just sits there. And if you need it down the road, then you can access it. It's kind of the equivalent of people who took out a home equity line of credit that they didn't really need in order to have a back pocket emergency cushion so they could get at the equity in their home in case they lost a job. The best scenario for paying for senior living using a reverse mortgage is if, if one person needs to or wants to go into senior living while the other person wants to stay in the home and there's not enough money to pay for senior living, this is a way to access it. Got it. So having those conversations and thinking through where do you want to be, what do you want to do, how do you want to use your home? that planning is going to be pretty important to decide how you want to use that and when you want to start using that. 100%. So Jean, your most recent book is aimed at Gen Z. And for them and for others of us who are probably decades away from senior living ourselves, but we're helping our parents through it. What can we learn from our parents' experience? Are there resources they have now we might not be able to count on? Are there things we're going to have to worry about that they don't? What does that look like? What can we learn from our parents' experience? You know, I was watching um, Jeopardy last night. Um, we watched Jeopardy in my house. And in Double Jeopardy, there were, you know, as there always are, six categories across the board. Um, one of them was finance and investing. And the contestants 
cleared the entire board before they took even a single question out of finance and investing. And the lesson that I took from this is nobody wants to talk about money. Not even the brilliant contestants on Jeopardy want to talk about money. And our parents were raised not to talk about money. You know, they were raised that it is incredibly rude. It's not something you do. It's not your business. If it's your parents, it's your business. Because here's what happens. We as adult children are late 50s, early 60s, and we are in this sandwich, right? We are trying to save for retirement for ourselves. We're probably helping our kids get through college and we've got our parents. And if our parents need help, we're gonna help them. We're gonna step in and we're gonna help them because we can put off our own retirement, we can borrow for college, but there is no other safety net for many of our parents. And so I think, I think the big lesson that we take away from this is if you haven't had the conversation either with your adult children or with your older parents, by the time they are 70 and you are 40, it's time. It, that it is just, it is, it is time. And as you bring your own children along, consider letting them into the tent a little bit more. I mean, not surprising people is, is the biggest gift that you can give them. So many surprises, right? It's true. Money is like verboten. You can't talk about that. So that's great advice. How can the younger generations set themselves up for success, for planning for senior living down the road. Feels so far away. What are some steps that younger generations can take right now? Um, I think for younger generations, it's all about options. And the way that you give yourself options is by accumulating money. Um, and back to my age-proof lessons, by staying healthy, right? You, you need to just, investing in your health is investing in your finances. That That's just something that we need to do our entire life. But by saving for the future, starting at a young age, habitually, even if you can't save a ton. Um, so putting as much as you can into your 401k, grab the matching dollars, put additional money, if you can, into a Roth IRA. Just make sure that every single time you get paid, you are putting some money away for the future. And then as soon as you have dependents, anybody who is counting on you to help take care of them, um, kids, older parents, a spouse, you have to make sure that you've put the documentation in place that makes this possible. Um, I am always shocked by the number of, of surveys that I read um, about people who just don't have a simple will. A will is the only document that will allow you to name guardians for a minor child. Um, so if you wanna have a choice there, you need a will. We also coming out of COVID, we know we all need durable powers of attorney for healthcare and for finance. We need to have named the people that we want to take care of these important decisions for us. If we can't take care of them ourselves, we should also have living wills. Um, the tell a doctor or a hospital what kind of um, life support and other measures we want taken if something happens to us, because things don't just happen when we get older, sadly, things happen every single day. Yeah, the power of attorney and the will are so important and getting that done, you know, get it done once. You can revisit it later, but get it done. We know how important that is. So thank you. That's great advice. So we're going to pop up a slide so that you can see all the places you can learn more about Jean, follow her on social media, um, pop that up right there so you can see that, um, see her books follow her uh, in the future. So again, you could take a screen capture that, write that down. Those are places to like and follow Jean. And now we're going to get to your questions. We welcome your questions for Jean. We're about to get started. And, and Richard had the first question and Richard wants to know, 
How do you include inflation in your calculations? Great question right now, right? Uh, Richard's retired and he's convinced inflation is going to be economically endemic in this cycle. So how do you include that in your calculations? Oh, it's a good question, Richard. It's really hard to do. I think the best way to deal with inflation is, I, you know, I'm not going to put an 8% persistent inflation rate in my calculations. Every retirement calculator that you're going to run on the internet is going to ask you for the rate of inflation, at least all the good ones. And you shouldn't zero that out. You should put something in there. But I think the best weapon that you have against inflation is A, using any extra cash that you have on hand to pay off high interest rate debt before it goes even higher, and B, by continuing to invest in the market because you need that growth to keep pace with inflation and with taxes. And retirement is a really long time. Um, and so people who believe that they could retire and pull their money from the market, you know, that's a 30 year window, you need to have some money working for you during that period of time. The other thing that I think is really interesting is that COVID actually, and the period of, of time that we just came through with the pandemic actually forced us to live kind of like our grandparents lived. Um, it forced us to uh, to take a step back and live without a lot of the conveniences that we got used to. And relying on how you live the last couple of years can be a really good playbook for just dealing with some of the controllable factors of inflation. So think about it. During COVID, you didn't want to go out of the house. That meant that every time you did go out of the house, you you made a list of, oh my God, I, I must get to the pharmacy. I must get to the grocery store. I must get to the dry cleaner. You made one trip, you drove less, you used less gas, you got out of the house once. Same thing with that grocery store. We weren't eating in restaurants at all. We were cooking. And we, again, we did not want to go to the grocery store. So we made a big list and we menu planned and we, ate our leftovers and we didn't throw out as much food. And when we were exercising, all the gyms were closed. So we weren't paying for those gyms, right? We were putting on our sneakers and going for a walk outside. That still works. Um, and so I think just, you know, just the act of menu planning and eating your leftovers, we throw out 40% of the food in this country. I know, it's, it's terrible. It's astonishing. Like it you, do, you do that, you get that under control, you've got inflation beat. It's so interesting. I never thought about that, but you're right. Like the pandemic gave us new habits. We may not have wanted to, but it certainly showed us what we can do, right? Yeah. What, how we can live. So that's great advice. Um, here's another question coming in from Kim. At what age would you recommend getting long-term care insurance? 50. You want to start shopping at, at about 50. Yeah. Um, and the reason is that if you start younger, you're going to pay the premiums for too many years before you need that coverage. By the time you're 60, there are a lot of health conditions that make you uninsurable. So if you think you want it, start looking around uh, around the age of, of 50. And just know, and I don't think I said this before, long-term care insurance does not make sense for everybody. It makes sense for a specific group of people. If you've got you know, millions of dollars, you are gonna be able to invest your own money and you'll be able to apply the 4% rule and you'll be able to fund your own care. If you have less than probably a half a million dollars in investable assets, um, maybe a little bit more, if you need care or your spouse needs care, you are going to spend your assets down and qualify for Medicaid. In between, long-term care insurance makes sense. And women need more of it than men do because um, what typically happens if you're married First of all, single people, they need long-term care insurance. They also need disability insurance. But if you're married and you are a younger wife living with an older guy, or even you're the same age, what's likely to happen is that the husband gets sick, the wife takes care of him. Um, if they need some help coming into the house, they'll pay for that. 
uh, but it'll be at home care. But once he's gone, who takes care of her? That's where you need the long-term care insurance. So if you're looking at um, a limited number of years of benefits, buy more for the woman. Yeah, women, we absolutely have different stuff to consider uh, for sure. Okay, Carmen has a question. Could you describe the process of using the equity in your home to invest in another home without selling your current one? Sure, you could um, borrow uh, money out of your home by either refinancing your home and doing a cash out refi and using that chunk of money to put a down payment on a second place. Or you could um, use a home equity loan or a home equity line of credit. Um, I would probably try to do a cash out refi. Look, you know, watch watch rates for a, a dip um, in in them. They're they're going up pretty steadily, but you know, watch them. They they dip from time to time and and lock into a good rate. I, I would probably do it that way. Anonymous is asking any tips on consolidating multiple four hundred one k accounts. Um, sure, not not super not super hard, but I gotta say we we um so I do a podcast as as Janet mentioned um called Her Money. Uh, I hope that you guys will will all take a second listen. Um, but we get we do a mailbag segment and we get questions from people who are anonymous and anonymous is just fine. So consolidating multiple four hundred one k accounts is just something that you do in order to make it easier on yourself administratively in most cases. You don't have to consolidate. Uh, in most cases with 401ks, if you've got more than $5,000 in the account, you can just leave it with your prior employer. But sometimes the fees go up and sometimes it gets to be a little bit of an administrative nightmare. Yeah. So um, I would pick uh, the place where you have your um, most active 401k today, probably your current employer, where is that housed? Is it, is it at Fidelity, Vanguard, T. Rowe? I'd roll everything else into that account. Um, you just call the administrator of your account and they will walk you through it and, and largely just do it for you. Stephanie wants to know, is the 10 times income goal for retirement your gross income or your net income? This messes me up every time. Gross it's versus gross, that I never Stephanie. know what to use. Yeah, it's gross. It is gross. Okay. So 10 times your gross income is your goal for retirement. Yep. Because it's going to be taxed, right? As we talked about before. Right. Okay. Another anonymous. Is there a downside to reverse mortgage in the scenario that you mentioned with one spouse and senior living and the other staying at home? I, I think there's always a risk with a reverse mortgage. Um, first of all, they're expensive. Um, they, they, the product is much better than it used to be. There have been some standards layered on what's known as a HECM mortgage, H-E-C-M. That's the product. And um, you all have to go through counseling before you can get a reverse mortgage these days, which is which is also a good thing, housing, housing counseling. But yeah, the, the downside is that um, that you've eaten up a lot of the equity in your home um, to pay for the care of the first spouse. The second spouse needs care and there's not as much money left there. Um, and and they once they move out, the home then has to be sold. So it's not for everybody, um, but it, it can, um, particularly if you're of the mind that you are never leaving your home, um, it can be a good solution. And, and that's who it's best for. It, it is really best for those people who never want to move. It's interesting the different ways you can use that equity in your home and just understanding what you want. And that'll kind of determine how you're going to use it, right? Well, well yeah. Or... And, and I think the what you want is a really interesting question. Um, an article that I clipped from the Wall Street Journal many, many years had the headline, she says Maine, he says Florida. And it was all about retirement, right? It was all about how these couples, many couples do not discuss what they want in retirement, when they want to retire, where they want to retire, you know, and, and that's got to be step one, right? Like sit down, 
forget about the numbers, talk about where you want to live, talk about how you want to live, talk about when you want to make this change, then you can start to fill in the gaps. But if you haven't had the, the upfront conversation about what this looks like, or if you're on different pages, that's where things get difficult. There's, there's also this new industry that has sprung up in retirement coaches, and they're not financial advisors. They are people who will help you figure out what am I going to do in retirement? You know, if you can't envision what life looks like, if you're thinking, yeah, I really want to play pickleball, that's one hour a day. Um, but I'm not sure what I'm going to do with the rest of my time, then, then sitting down with somebody who can walk you through might not be a bad idea. That's great. Yeah. It, and with retirement lasting a lot longer, right? right. Well, you said we're going to be living a really long time retired. What does that look like? It's exactly yeah, imagining what that back half looks like is it's kind of interesting. Um, so this is a great question that just came in too. And 401k, like I tell everybody, especially when you have a company match, it's free money you leave on the table if you're not using your match. I mean, that's just free money for you. But this person says, I started my 401k later in life. Should I be more aggressive in my saving? I savings. I worry that I'm not going to have enough when it's time to retire. Yes, you should be more aggressive in your savings. Um, and that's where the benchmarks become helpful, right? If you're not hitting those benchmarks, and again, you want to have one times your savings at age 30, three times at age 40, six times at 50, eight times at 60, 10 times by the time you retire. In general, if you start young and you put away 15% of whatever it is you're earning, you're going to hit those numbers. But if you've started late or you're under saving, I, I really, I love where this question went, Janet, because as you were reading it, I, I thought they were going to say, should I be more aggressive with my investments? And the answer there is no. Um, you want to take the appropriate amount of risk with your investments for somebody at your age, but being more aggressive with your saving, 100%. Yeah, and I mean, every, you know, everybody doesn't know that once you hit, I think it's 50, you have that step up, you can put more in your 401k. So yep. put in as much as you can. Jean wants to know, should we consult our financial advisor before moving into an assisted living center? And I'd actually add to that, when do you start consulting your financial advisor about moving into an assisted living center? I would say as soon as you start um, thinking about moving into an assisted living center, because you know there are different price points um, and you wanna make sure that whatever you go for, whatever you choose is sustainable. Your financial advisor can help you run those numbers. So 100%, you sit down with them, you talk about, this is what I'm thinking, these are the costs, um, and, and let them help you work through it. it. It's a great use of a financial advisor. That's great. Yeah, it's, it's, you know, we need advisors for things. It's like, we have to, we have to get help from the people that know that space, right? It's their emotional decisions in addition to, to being practical ones. So uh, getting that help from the people that do it every day is great. Here's a really good question that I really want to know the answer to as well. Is there a best age to start claiming social security? Best. Um, best is a difficult word. In general, the longer you wait, the long, the bigger your benefit is going to be in general, right? For every year that you wait, beyond age 62 until age 70, you get a benefit jump annually of about 8%. That's a return on your money that is really hard to replicate anywhere else. Um, and so particularly if you are the higher earner in the family, waiting to max out that benefit is, is something that is going to make sense. But if you are struggling. If you need the money to pay for health care, to pay for the roof over your head, to pay for food, if you're unable to do that, then you wait as long as possible. And um, and there are different strategies that, you know, if one person is younger than the other, maybe they start, um, or if they're the lower earner, there are so many permutations. I don't want to, um, I don't want to 
ballpark it for everybody, but I will point you to um, a couple of resources. AARP has really good free resources on where to and when to take Social Security. And if you're willing to spend a little bit of money, um, there's a calculator called Maximize My Social Security. I think it's $49. And they will you know, take your information, your spouse's information, and tell you exactly when to claim. That's helpful. Yeah, those are always the question. I never thought about that. Whoever gets the least, if you have to get it sooner, take that one so the other one's growing more, right? Yeah. Seems to consider. Um, here's a great question. Should I care about my FICO score anymore? I'm yeah. negotiating ending a payment on my co-signed son's student loan. Should I care about that anymore? Is it, does it matter as much in retirement? Well, you know, it matters if you ever think that you're going to use a credit card, right? Or you're going to need to buy another car. Life doesn't end in, in retirement. And, and it's funny, I, I have talked to a lot of financial advisors who, who counsel people moving into retirement and they, they, they often say, oh, I'm going to buy my last car. Guess what? It's not your last car. You know, you're going to be retired for 30 years. You're going to have another car or two likely before you stop driving. If you borrow to buy that car, you want a good FICO score. Yeah, you're right. We think retirement's going to be a lot shorter than it is. So that's the good news. The good news is we're going to get to enjoy all of that for a lot longer time. So we are at the top of the hour. And Jean and I really want to thank you for joining us today. Thank you for all your great questions. Um, please come back and join us in November. Our next webinar is going to be on breaking the stigma around dementia. And dementia is a difficult diagnosis for a family to go through, but it also doesn't look the same for everybody. We're going to bring in a panel of experts who are going to talk about how approaches and perceptions of dementia are changing and why that's a really good thing. And each of our webinars features a different subject. You can visit brookdale.com slash in the know to discover more. There's a whole bunch of me on the screen right now. We do hope we see you again soon. You could follow Jean at all of the information we gave you earlier. We appreciate you being here. And until next time, we hope you stay safe, happy, and well. Thank you so much. And thank you, Jean. Thank you.